Well, this evening, as I've already mentioned, we're going to just look at two verses in Luke's gospel, verses 27 through 28, Lord willing. <laughs> Actually, we are going to back up just a little bit because I wanted to get a running start at this, but let me read these two verses to begin. While Jesus was saying these things, and these are the things we looked at this morning, one of the women in the crowd raised her voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breasts at which you nursed. But he said, on the contrary, blessed are those who hear the word of God and observe it. Well, may the Lord bless his word again to our uh, hearing uh, this evening. Now, uh, again, we were reminded this morning that Jesus taught his disciples to pray that his kingdom would come. That's the reason why we were praying as we were this evening. And as we get together to pray on Wednesdays or in our services, this should be first and foremost in our minds. We're praying that it would not only be first in uh, our hearts, but that the Father would work through us by His Word and His Spirit to make it first in the hearts of others. That's the only way it's going to happen, is by sharing the gospel with others. You know, again, that is the message God uses to save. Just, it's so simple. Uh, so anyway, that's what the Lord desires of us. And then, then he showed his disciples and the Jews something of the power of that kingdom when he cast the demon out of a man who was mute. And this was to demonstrate not only that he had power over the demonic realm, that Satan's kingdom could not withstand an assault from his kingdom, but that he also has authority over the souls of men. Remember, he bound the strong man. He's able to plunder the strong man's house. He's able to deliver all whom the Father has given to him. Jesus has that authority. That is the power or the, well, yes, the, the authority of the kingdom of heaven. And the point is that that same power Jesus has given to us, that same power works in us to give us the strength that we need to share his word so that others might hear and be freed from the devil's kingdom. And how does Jesus plunder the strong man's house except through his servants, whom he's already plundered, as it were, already taken, uh, that they might share that gospel. And by the way, unless we learn to appropriate this power of the Holy Spirit, we're never really going to be able to find the strength that we need to be able to do this. And of course, that's involved, but it's actually quite simple. Read the Word, pray, resist sin, repent, turn away from it, look to the Lord for strength, and He will give it to us. Now, this evening, Jesus directs us to something else that the Spirit does in our lives. And really, it, the two are, are combined. I mean, He does give us the strength to be able to share the gospel. And really, that's the same thing as what we're looking at this evening. He has the power to transform us into the image of our Lord Jesus in order that we might be blessed. Now, this morning, Jesus closed his message to the Jews with that warning that we were looking at. Let me read it again in verses 24 through 26, because what we want to do is look at the curse, the warning, before we look at the blessing. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and do it. Well, Jesus said this, when the unclean spirit goes out of a man, it passes through waterless places seeking rest and not finding any. It says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds it swept and put in order. Then it goes and takes along seven other spirits more evil than itself. And they go in and live there. And the last state of that man becomes worse than the first. Now, this morning I mentioned that there are various applications of that. It certainly applies to you know, a demon-possessed person. Jesus delivered many who were demon-possessed. And when those demons went out, unless that person received him, unless the Holy Spirit came in and occupied that room, as it were, he was still liable, or she, but all our examples, I think, are of men who were demon-possessed. Uh, they, they were still liable to further possession. Uh, so it can be applied on a personal level, but I believe Jesus was applying this on a national level. And we see that by comparing it to Matthew uh, chapter 12. Israel was uh, basically characterized as being in darkness before Jesus came. Uh, he is the light that dawned in that valley of the shadow of death. 
uh, one of the things that uh, was the result, or I should say brought about this darkness, was the demonic activity. I mean, it's, it's been said that perhaps there were more demon-possessed people at the time of Jesus than at any other time in history. And of course, there was a reason for that. It was so that our Lord might show His power uh, by delivering these people. I mean, consider the number of demons that the Lord cast out in His ministry. Consider He also faced the devil Himself. Now, coming uh, close to the end of His ministry and Having practically banished demonic activity from the land, Israel's house was swept and in order, but it still needed to be occupied. They needed to receive their Messiah, but they refused. And so I believe we see in Scripture the fulfillment of what Jesus is warning of here. The devil returned with more of his demons, and Israel's condition became worse. Judas betrayed Jesus, and he did that, of course, at the behest of Satan into the hands of the Jews. Uh, the Jewish leaders uh, handed him over to the Romans, and they did that again by the power of Satan and by his behest. And the Romans unjustly condemned Jesus to die. Satan was certainly behind all of this. And after his crucifixion, his resurrection and his ascension, and the subsequent revival that he poured out on the day of Pentecost and the worldwide proclamation of the gospel. Those who continued to reject Jesus grew worse and sinned against the Lord until finally the Lord did what he said he would do in the Olivet Discourse. He was going to send an army to destroy their city and their temple and disperse them throughout the world. This curse was ultimately fulfilled. I should say the curse was perhaps even more ultimately fulfilled in those Jews that actually died in an unrepentant state because the last state was far worse than the first. Like anyone who refuses to believe, they sunk down into hell where they would be punished forever. Now again, Jesus was saying that this would be the outcome uh, for everyone who did not receive Jesus. They would fall under the curse, and not just the curse of the broken covenant of works, but the continued curse Jesus was pronouncing upon them for not receiving Him, having received all this light, all this privilege, all this knowledge about Jesus, having the gospel, having this treasure handed over to them, they still reject it. So this evening, let's take a look at um, the good news. Okay, the good news is, what about those who received Him? What did they actually get? Well, Jesus tells us that it's the opposite of what the others would get. They would not be cursed, but they would be blessed. Now, before Jesus had finished speaking these warnings to the Jews, a woman in the crowd who had seen his authority over the demons, heard the wisdom with which he spoke, and understood something of who he was. She could no longer really contain herself, and she cried out in verse 27, blessed is the womb that bore you and the breasts at which you nursed." Now, we, we don't really know if this woman actually knew um, Jesus' mother, if she actually knew, knew Mary. It, it's certainly possible that she did, uh, because we know from a parallel account in Matthew chapter 12, the very next thing that happened after Jesus finished speaking was that Mary came to meet Jesus. Uh, we know that His mother and His brothers had all come out to speak to Him. So perhaps she was pointing to her as she, as she was coming. Perhaps she knew her, or perhaps she didn't know her at all, but just assumed that this woman must be blessed to have borne such a person. Now, we do know that, um, that Mary is blessed, right? She was blessed to be the bearer or the one who would give birth to the Messiah. But we do also know that Mary has been overly honored in certain parts of the historic Christian church even to the point of idolatry, right? Some have uh, taken the title which was given to her historically by Orthodox Christians, and I mean Orthodox in the sense that they believe the truth, they've taken the title uh, Mother of God, okay, beyond what it was meant to signify historically to basically, which, well, historically it was meant to say that she was the one who was carrying the one who was actually God in our nature. She is the mother of God. The one, the child in her womb is God. 
but they've taken it to mean that somehow Jesus derived uh, his divinity from his mother. Now, that's idolatry. That's blasphemy. That's, that's elevating a creature uh, to essentially uh, godhood. At uh, one time, I was watching a, um, a debate on uh, television between, um, uh, it was, well, let's see, it was a Jesuit priest and um, uh, Walter Martin. It was being moderated by John Ankerbird. And as they're arguing about this idea of Mary, the Jesuit priest, basically took this description of Israel from the book of Revelation. Listen to what it says here, Revelation 12, verses 1 and 2. A great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and on her head a crown of 12 stars and she was with child. And she cried out being in labor and in pain to give birth and of course this woman gives birth to the Messiah and uh, the dragon is there ready to swallow the child up but uh, wings are given to the child and he's able to escape into the wilderness. Well, this Jesuit priest applied this passage to Mary and called her a cosmic creature, called her by the titles co-mediatrix, co-redemptrix. She is somebody who is also involved in our salvation. Somehow she works along with Jesus in order to save us. So Mary has been elevated well beyond, we might say, uh, what the Lord actually intended. And this may have made us react in the opposite direction to the point where we want to sort of back off and say there really isn't anything special about Mary at all. But we do need to understand that she was, uh, she was special. She was singled out by God to be the mother of our Lord Jesus Christ, to conceive and give birth to the Messiah, to nurse Him from infancy, and to nurture and to teach Him from childhood to adulthood. Uh, that was a great honor. As a matter of fact, Jesus, uh, Mary basically says of herself in what we call the Magnificat, or what is really the Song of Mary in Luke 1, verses 46 through 49 that we looked at uh, several months ago. My soul exalts the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. For he has had regard for the humble state of his bond slave. For behold, from this time on, all generations will count me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is His name." Now, Mary was blessed, but we're going to look at in just a moment why it was that she really was blessed, and maybe it's not exactly uh, what we think. But now, getting back to this woman, okay, she says basically, Mary was blessed. Blessed is the womb that bore you. Blessed are the breasts that nursed you. What this woman was saying here was really not so much trying to honor Mary as it was to honor Jesus, right? This was a common blessing that was used among the Jews. If they wanted to honor someone, they would say, blessed is the one who bore him. And when they wanted to curse somebody, they would say, cursed is she who nursed him. Uh, this is just simply a Hebrew way of saying what this woman was saying is your mother must be, have been a very happy woman to have a son like you, okay? That's, that's really what's behind this. Now, I want to just pause for a moment and, and think about this because this woman is teaching us really, I think, an important lesson. And the lesson is this, that those who see value in the Lord Jesus, which she did, want to honor Him, right? This, this was the typical Hebrew way of blessing him and saying, you are blessed. And I think that this is true uh, at a certain level, even among those who don't believe in Jesus, who, who don't really believe him in the sense that we believe in him, that he is the son of God and that by believing in him, you might have eternal life. I mean, think about most of the Jews in Palestine. When they heard Jesus was in the area, they would come out to see him when he was in town, if for no other reason than that they might see a miracle or be healed by him. They saw value in Jesus. Luke writes this in Luke chapter 6, verses 17 through 19. Jesus came down with them, that is with his disciples, and stood on a level place. And there was a large crowd of his disciples and a great throng of people from all Judea and Jerusalem 
and the coastal region of Tyre and Sidon who had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And those who were troubled with unclean spirits were being cured. And all the people were trying to touch him for power was coming from him and healing them all. Those who see value in Jesus want to honor him. On one occasion, the chief priests and the Pharisees in Jerusalem had sent their uh, officers out to arrest Jesus. But when they went to him and they heard him speak, they returned without him. And when the chief priests and the Pharisees saw that they hadn't brought him back, they asked why. And they answered in John 7, verse 45, never has a man spoken the way this man speaks. You know, Jesus, because of his character, has really captured the imaginations of many throughout the history of this world. Some have even written books trying to uncover who he really was. They're so fascinated by Jesus. They see value in him. So even unbelievers see value in Jesus. But how much more those who see him for what he really is, who really see his worth, who really see his value, how much more do they honor him? I mean, well beyond what this woman did. This is really what moved Stephen to lay down his life to denounce the leaders of Israel for crucifying the Messiah. Remember, he was willing to boldly, uh, basically rebuke them, even though he knew that he would likely be killed for it, and that's exactly what happened. The Apostle Paul, it's what moved him to hazard so many perils, so many hardships to preach the gospel to the whole Roman Empire because he saw the value of Jesus and he wanted to honor him. This is what moved Luther to stand up against the entire church. And really, the church was so tied to the government in those days and had the, almost the power of the sword entrusted to it, or at least had power over those who had the power of the sword, that he was doing this at the risk of his own life. But he was willing to do that because he saw the value of Jesus. So many others in the history of the church have laid down their lives to serve him. And really, this is also what moves us to worship Him and to serve Him. And even be willing to lay down our own lives for Him because we see that the Lord is worthy. So this woman cries out regarding the worthiness of our Lord Jesus Christ because she sees value in Him. Now, Jesus, I think, knew what she meant, obviously. He's, um, he has the one with insight into all uh, men. He knows what's going on in their hearts. And she knew that, that, that he, excuse me, he knew that she was honoring him. But he took the opportunity to address what she had said, okay? Yes, my mother is blessed. All generations would, would call her so. Jesus didn't want to take away the honor that his father had bestowed upon Mary. But we need to understand that she wasn't blessed only because she gave birth to him because she had a son who was like him. She was blessed because she heard the word of God and she obeyed it. As everybody else who hears the word and obeys will also be blessed. Jesus replies in verse 28 to the woman's statement, on the contrary, blessed are those who hear the word of God and observe it. Now remember at the beginning I mentioned this, that Jesus sometimes says things that almost seem legalistic, don't they? You know, do this and you will live. At first blush, it does seem to be, it seems like Jesus is saying that the blessedness, the happiness is something that we earn by keeping the law. There's other places in Scripture where it seems like he even ties salvation to obedience. Uh, just turning back uh, Luke to chapter 10, just one chapter, Remember, a lawyer asked him on one occasion in Luke 10, uh, verses 25 through 28, he said, first of all, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Well, Jesus replied by asking him this question, what is written in the law? How does it read to you? And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And then the answer to the question or Jesus' response might set us back. And he said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. 
he was right. If you love God, you know, if you want to enter into life, if you want to inherit eternal life, you need to love God, you need to love your neighbor. So just do this and you will have life. It does seem, you know, like fairly clearly as though our Lord Jesus is saying, keep the law and you will be saved. But we do need to ask this question. Is that what Jesus is really saying here? That salvation, our justification, and our ultimate happiness rests upon our keeping of the law. Is that how we save ourselves? Is that how we become happy or blessed? If that's the case, wouldn't that contradict what Paul tells us quite clearly in the book of Galatians when he writes in Galatians 3.21, for if a law had been given which was able to impart life, then righteousness would indeed have been based on law. Jesus says, keep these things and you will live. Paul says that there hasn't been a law given that is able to impart life. And then Paul goes on, well, actually said a little bit earlier in Galatians 3.10, for as many as are of the works of the law are under a curse. By this he meant that if we try to justify ourselves before God by our own obedience, then we are under the curse. And we should see this, I think, perhaps as Paul saying that we will continue under the curse we are already under, that Adam put us under in the garden when he sinned against the Lord. Now, are we to see Jesus and Paul as being basically at odds with one another? Well, of course not. And I think when we understand what both are saying, we can see this. Jesus is telling us, he is telling us, that to inherit eternal life, we, we must keep the law, okay? We must keep the law. We must love God with our whole being and our neighbor as ourselves. That's why he told the lawyer that he was right. Do this and you will live. But notice he never told the lawyer that he could actually do this, okay? No one is able to do this. The fall made it impossible. Theoretically, if you could do that, you could actually save yourself, but nobody can do it because the fall made this impossible. The lawyer had already failed in Adam. He had already sinned many, many times since he had come into the world. And that's why Paul tells us that a law was never given that could impart life. It's because we can't keep that law. That was not the reason why the law was actually given. The law was actually given to show us that we are sinners, not to turn it into a way of salvation. Trying to keep it, he says, will only keep us under the curse. So then what does Jesus mean when he said, blessed are those who hear the word of God and observe it? Well, what he was saying is the same thing that I've been saying since this service began, essentially this. He meant that those who have believed in him, those who are in the new covenant, those who have the law of God in their minds and written upon their hearts, who have the power of the Holy Spirit to obey the law, these are blessed. They are blessed with eternal life. They are blessed as the heirs of the kingdom. Everything that we read about in Scripture that are blessings from God all of these things come through this one blessing of having trusted in the Lord Jesus. The Bible clearly tells us we could not keep the law. And so God sent his son to keep it for us so that if we would only trust in him, he would give us that righteousness so that we might be justified by God. And the evidence that we have believed savingly in the Lord Jesus Christ and that we're not just simply, well, uh, having an historic faith, you know, just believing these things to be true and believing ourselves to be saved. The evidence that we have believed is our obedience. Our obedience shows that the Spirit of God is at work within our hearts to, as Paul writes in Romans chapter 8, verse 4, fulfill the requirements of the law. This is something, again, that antinomians miss all the time. They think that because Jesus has kept the law that we no longer need to keep it in any sense. And yet the blessing of the new covenant is the power actually to obey the Lord. Those who hear the word of God and obey it are saved and that is why they are blessed. Now getting back to Mary, that's really the reason why Mary was blessed in the first place, wasn't it? Not just because she gave birth to the Messiah, 
but because she believed in the Messiah and was justified through faith in Him and showed that she was through her obedience. Why did God choose her to carry His Son? It's because she had faith in Him, because she was just, because she was obedient, because that the Holy Spirit was working in her to make her into a faithful daughter, one that God would desire to raise His, his Son. So how can we be blessed is really the question we want to ask, and that is by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ and receiving His salvation. And how can we know that we have this blessing? We can only know by the fact that when we hear God's Word, we do what it says. We actually obey Him. You know, again, it's, it seems like a very simple principle you know, it's, it's, it's not rocket science to know what God wants us to do. The Holy Spirit is the one who actually gives us the power to do it. Not perfectly, because we still have corruption in our souls, but we really do want to obey Him. Now, let me, uh, let me just simply close with uh, an example. I think historic examples are always encouraging. And this is from the life of someone who did this very thing, who demonstrated that he really knew the Lord because... When he understood what God wanted him to do, he did his best actually to do it. And really, the Lord used him very powerfully as well. And that man is, is General Thomas Stonewall Jackson. Okay? I don't know if you've read much about his life. He was actually very simplistic in his thinking, but so dedicated and so trusting in the Lord, the Lord used him very, very powerfully. Well, let me read just a, a quote from a, a very condensed biography that, that I found online of uh, Stonewall Jackson that gives us a, a little bit of a sketch of his character. He writes this, very shortly after he moved to the, to the town, and he's talking here about Lexington, Virginia, in 1851, following his involvement in the Mexican-American War, which is where the Battle of the Alamo was fought. I don't know whether he was involved in that or not, but he was involved in, in that war. Uh, after this, he moved to, to this town. Jackson became a member of Lexington Presbyterian Church, which was pastored by William White, a man who would become a very important spiritual influence on him. This was the first time he had ever been a member of a local church. A friend from this time said, quote, the striking characteristic of his mind became his profound reverence for divine authority. I never knew anyone whose reverence for God was so all-pervading, who felt so completely his entire dependence upon God." Close quote. Another friend said that Jackson's faith was, quote, as simple as a child's in taking the Word of God as his guide and unhesitatingly accepting all therein revealed, close quote. He decided that he wanted his Christian life to be marked by a love for God and a sense of God's love for him in return. He resolved never to violate the known will of God. He determined that he would never do anything that went against what God commanded and with his usual determination sought to do just that. If you read this whole, um, again, this whole biography, you'd find out that Jackson didn't find that as he was, you know, developing in life, that things came easily to him. Uh, he found that he had to work very hard for, you know, to accomplish anything, to be able to acquire the skills that he needed. On one occasion, he was um, uh, asked to uh, pray publicly in his church, and he did such a poor job that the pastor wasn't going to ask him again, but Jackson said, no, ask me again. I want to try. I want to do better, and he eventually became one of the leading public prayers of that particular church. So he had to work hard. So he basically determined that he would never do anything that went against what God commanded and with his usual determination sought to do just that. Jackson was a guy who had a temper, and this was something he fought against. Yet during the Civil War, there are only a handful of known instances of him ever losing his temper, even amidst all of the stress and strain of war he did his absolute utmost to maintain his godly character and to fight against sin. 
Very few of his friends could identify any serious sin in his life. Little wonder that he was soon chosen uh, to be a deacon. I think, you know, again, historic examples are very encouraging. And one of the other things is that, that he uh, trusted God. You know, he, he would sit on his horse in the middle of a battle with the bullets whizzing around him, and he wouldn't flinch. And he was asked by his men, how can you have such courage? You know, I mean, they're, they're afraid for their, for their lives, and he's sitting there like a stone wall, right? How, where do you get that courage? And he said, you know, I, I believe that I'm just as safe here as I would be in my bed because my life is in God's hands. When it's his time, he will call me home. Uh, by the way, I would recommend um, if you enjoy historic movies, Gods and Generals, it's all about the life of, of Stonewall Jackson. And um, I had a chance to show it for somebody very close to me who was an unbeliever, and it made them squirm in the chair because it was just, it was just so powerful, his, his uh, example of godliness, what we've just read about right here. So General Jackson was blessed because he heard the Word of God and he did it. But the reason why he did what the Word of God said was because he had the greater blessing of that new covenant blessing of the Holy Spirit in his heart. He had trusted the Lord Jesus, and the Spirit of God was working in him to listen and to do. Jesus is telling this woman, he's telling us as well, that we are blessed if we have this same kind of heart and this same kind of determination. You know, we're not going to be perfect on this side of heaven, but we will strive after perfection. We'll want to be as much like Jesus as we can possibly be. Uh, that is the mark that we know Him. Well, let's bow, shall we, for a moment of prayer, and let's ask the Lord to, um, oh, to give us this kind of heart. I mean, we have this desire if the Spirit of God is in us. We need more of His work to make us more like this. Let's pray that the Lord would, would do that.